Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Laura Bragg. I am the Vice President for Advocacy for the Foundation for Excellence in Education, um, and I am thrilled to see you here to um, learn from our panelists and also share what you see happening in your state around K-3 literacy. Um, I have been working on this policy, and I see, I see a former principal that was on my state board, and I automatically went, uh-oh, I'm not prepared. <laughs> um, I've been working on this policy since 2001 when um, I was fortunate enough, although I was scared at the time, to be the person responsible for implementing it in Florida. Um, it's, it was important then because of how critical it was to get implementation right. Implementation, um, uh, Tony Bennett once said implementation, uh, departments of education are the graveyard of implementation. <laughs> and it's one thing to get a law passed, it's another to make sure that it's implemented in a way that actually has an impact on kids in the classroom. It is important to me now because I have a child in kindergarten. And it was important throughout my career as a high school history teacher. So I want to show you, and I hope it shows up on the, the screen. Two weeks ago, a former student of mine who is now a history teacher sent me this picture of work from a ninth grade student. If you can't read it, you should get up and come look at the screen. This is a ninth grader who cannot write because they cannot read. They cannot spell. They may know the concept, but they cannot write about it. They cannot express themselves. Ninth grader, 15 year old. This is from a student who's passed through the system, who was not caught, didn't get what they needed. And this student will drop out. The student has an 88% chance of dropping out of high school as a ninth grader. This to me, shows why this policy or a policy like this is not optional. It has to be in place so that I don't get more pictures from a student that I taught who is now teaching. What's important about a K-3 comprehensive policy that would have made sure that that child did not make it to ninth grade is that you start in kindergarten, you have four years kindergarten, first, second, and third grade to ensure that a child does not get to ninth grade and does not know how to spell the word paid or soldier or with or where. It's important to include the hard line in the sand because if you don't stop social promotion, then you are creating a, a, a entire nation full of high school dropouts. But retention has to be a last resort. If we do our job well, then by third grade, it's not an issue because we've caught them early. And if you are a student who needs that extra year in third grade, you got to get something different. You can't send them through the same thing again and hope that it sticks the second time. We have a fabulous panel to talk to you today about the implementation and how critical it is of a K-3 reading policy. Carrie Miller, former third grade teacher in Florida when this policy was implemented, worked in the state reading office with me and is now at the foundation and she helped states implement, help develop and implement great policies. Uh, Ohio Superintendent of Education, Dick Ross, who um, is on the front lines of implementing this. If you have a strong leader in a state who makes it their priority, amazing things can happen. And then Senator Gray Tolleson, who is uh, like me from Mississippi, so there's a special connection there. I'm a Mississippi State Bulldog. He's an old Miss Rebel, so we don't we don't spend a lot of time together. But um, who is a legislator? He was a legislator who helped push this policy in Mississippi. And what's important is that he is helped to, helping to push implementation. He didn't say, "All right, I'm a senator. I got it passed. I'm done." He is working with the department to make sure that this policy is implemented and that it meets the intent, legislative intent. So I don't really need to say uh, much else. Um, I want to get I want to get the crew started. And it's really hard for me to moderate because I'm used to serving on a panel. So um, they may have to shut me up instead of the other way around. So, but thank you for being here, Carrie. Thank you. Yes. 
Can y'all hear me okay? You want to come up here? Or no. Gonna use it all? <laughs> you know? I'm good right here. Um, my name is Karen Miller. I'm a policy director for K3 Reading at the Foundation for Excellence in Education, as Marilyn described. And I think one of the huge misconceptions of a K-3 reading policy like floor does is that it's about retaining students and um, retention for retention's sake and that is just a huge misconception and so what we want to talk about today um, is what it takes to have a comprehensive K-3 reading policy and there are 10 fundamental principles for a K-3 reading policy. It starts with early literacy screening. It's a simple screener that occurs within the first 30 days of kindergarten to identify kids that may struggle in the area of reading. It's twofold. It, it identifies kids that may be at risk of reading failure and we wanna catch them early, but it also provides information to teachers to better inform instruction. Um, for any student identified with a deficiency in reading, parents are to be notified um, immediately. So parents are involved from the very beginning. Um, and those students that have been identified m that may be at risk of reading failure are required to be monitored more regularly throughout the school year to ensure um, that their progress, they're making progress, and if not, instruction changes along the way to address their specific needs. Um, once parents are notified, they are collaborated with to create what's called an individual reading plan. So the individual reading plan basically prescribes the interventions that were going to take place within the school setting to meet that particular student's needs, um, which also includes home reading strategies, not to help parents become teachers of reading, but to help them better support their kids with literacy at home in everyday, everyday life. Okay. Um, and then you'll have your retention component. So starting again in kindergarten, as Marilyn described, four years to watch kids, progress monitor those kids, adjust instruction to meet their need, provide intensive intervention to catch them up with their peers. And at the end of third grade, if they're unable to demonstrate sufficient reading skills to be prepared for the rigor that they're going to face in fourth grade, then they are retained. Um, the way in which students um, demonstrate they're ready for fourth grade. There's many ways. Um, it shouldn't be one test on one day, which is an another huge misconception of Florida's policy, and I, I believe some policies you'll hear about here today as well, um, that there are multiple options for kids to demonstrate whether they are ready for fourth grade, the, the more rigorous coursework in which they're going to face in fourth grade. Um, in Florida, it is um, your state reading assessment is your first objective indicator to determine whether a child is ready for fourth grade. Um, there's two other options. One is alternative alternative reading assessment given a little later um, to see if they're able to demonstrate sufficient reading skills for promotion. Um, and lastly, there's a, a test-based teacher-created portfolio that gives a different way of assessing those kids. It's, it's along the way, so it, it's, uh, those are administered as the kid progresses through third grade in more of an informal setting in classroom, almost like day-to-day -day work or day-to-day -day assessments that regularly occur, classroom-based assessments that regularly occur, giving them plenty of time as well, so there's not a time factor involved. So it just gives them an alternative way to demonstrate if they're ready for fourth grade. So giving, in Florida, there are those three options to demonstrate you're ready for fourth grade. And we, we advocate heavily that there is not one test on one day that makes that determining factor for promotion. That's a big decision. There should be multiple data points um, to use to make that decision for kids. And the other crucial component of that is that ensuring that the kids that are in need of, of severe interventions actually receive them. So, so one important factor when determining kids that actually need an additional year of intensive interventions is ensuring you're targeting just those students. So in the state of Florida, we have our state tests, it's level one through level five, that could be changing here soon, but at currently it's level one through level five, level one being the lowest level of students. Those are the students that are initially targeted that may need the additional year of intensive interventions to catch them up with their peers. So we're not, we're not um, targeting any students except unless they are severely below grade level. There are kids that might not be proficient but could receive the intervention services that they need and might not need an entire year of intervention services that they can be served in fourth grade. So it's important when considering this policy is that you really want to ensure the kids that truly need an entire year of intensive intervention are the ones that you're catching to provide that service. 
Um, and then lastly, retention in the state of Florida doesn't mean retention. You send the kids through third grade one more time in hopes that you get a different result. Um, it's required that more intensified interventions are provided to those students. Um, some examples of those intensified interventions would be summer reading camp um, for our students that may potentially face retention. Love to see summer reading camps K-3 if possible. Um, extended time is one of the most important factors for the kids. They need more time. Um, Another example of an intervention would be um, supplemental tutoring before and after school or even an option of a mentor. So uh, just a, a, a body that comes in, supports that student, reads with that student, shows the importance of, of literacy, shows why it's important for their education, their future education, and so forth. So it could be a mentor that supports them through the effort. And then back to time, they receive more time of intervention services targeted their specific needs. So just some examples of those interventions. Every state's a little bit different, but those are some examples of the interventions that a child that would be in third grade um, because they're unable to demonstrate skills and will flounder in fourth grade without the necessary skills that they need. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, and I think this probably goes without saying in this group, but a policy is only as good as its implementation. So a state may have all 10 of the fundamental principles of a K-3 comprehensive policy, but it takes effective implementation of that policy to actually have an impact on our students. So in Florida, it started with leadership. So you kind of see our wheel here. Um, we also provided a great deal of training for educators and parents um, through um, this policy and one way in which we provided um, teacher training was with reading coaches job embedded professional development um, you'll hear that a lot of sit and get um, if you will professional development doesn't quite stick um, and so putting reading coaches in schools gives the opportunity to have a job embedded professional development um, so teachers can actually apply what they've learned right there um, get observed in that form and they can work together to master their craft and get better at teaching kids that struggle. Um, so it's a, it's a great support system and, and it's great to build master teachers um, at the school level um, for K-3 reading instruction. Um, something else Florida did to um, implement this policy was set up a comprehensive assessment system. Um, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's really not. It's just a K-3 system that monitors the progress of our kids that struggle and ensuring that instruction teachers have information um, to um, adjust instruction to better meet the needs of their students. Um, a great tool um, for our teachers in the state of Florida and many other states have similar tools um, to ensure that we're catching the students that need extra help. Um, we also have a strong focus on scientifically based reading instruction intervention. That's all our training is wrapped around that and making database decisions using data to better inform instruction. Um, I mentioned summer reading camps. That is one component of Florida's policy for third grade students that um, are severely below grade level. There's a summer reading camp program offered to those students that's um, very um, intensive um, for those students that need it. And lastly, and I think a lot of times overlooked, is partnerships. Um, Florida did a fabulous job of working with business and communities, um, partnering to simply raise awareness of the importance of literacy statewide. Um, just to give a couple of examples, um, one example is a partnership with Bells. It's a Florida specific, almost like a Macy's, but it's a Florida um, department. And they literally sold books and those proceeds went to money to provide professional development to teachers. You could use it however you see fit, but that's the, was the goal of that particular one. And then there was another um, example, there's lots, um, but another example would be we, would they, Just Read Florida, we, I say, because I used to work for Just Read Florida, um, <laughs> sorry, um, we partnered um, with McDonald's and just a simple tray liner had advertised for families, Just Read Families website that they could get all resources and just a little note of why it's important to read with your kids every day. So just some examples of the partners um, that we establish to raise awareness of the importance of literacy statewide. Um, so we got lots of stakeholders involved um, to move forward with supporting such a policy. 
Um, and the, thank you, and the results. <laughs> um, this chart basically shows um, the percent of students scoring at the lowest achievement level in third grade. So the blue bar in, two, in 2001, we had 29% of our students scoring at the lowest achievement level on our state exam. And you see 10 years later, I believe it's 2000. 10, so a decade later, you see that we basically cut that illiteracy rate nearly in half. So you'll see, because I'm sure your eyes are glued to 2011, 2012, and 2013, you'll see that we've had some adjustments lately, and we'll continue to have some adjustments, and we'll work through those transitions as we move forward. Um, but we increased our standards on our FCAT, so our FCAT test became a little 2.0, came a little more difficult. Um, and then we increased the proficiency score the very next year, and this year we have a new assessment. So we're working through some transitions right now, but we hope um, to see a drop after this upcoming coming year, right? We have this first year, and then after that, you should see back on the right track a decline. Um, all right, next slide. Oh, wait, 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 let me say one more thing, sorry. Um, and so the yellow bars show the percent of students that faced retention. Um, and you'll see um, that the very first year, 23% um, face re retention initially, that was just based on their state reading exam, but know that they have two other options um, to demonstrate proficiency. And so the 14% represents after our good cause exemptions were applied. So there's some exemptions I, I should have talked about, but I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Um, and so you see how our kids became readers when our kids became better readers, we have less retentions, which obviously is what we want to see. The goal is not retaining students. The goal is for all kids to be reading by the end of third grade. That is the goal of this policy and the only goal of this policy. Thank you. One other piece of data that we found um, pretty exciting, um, I don't know that we planned for it, um, but it had a huge impact, is our students with disabilities um, or students that may be referred for special education. Um, so this is an example of 300 Title I schools um, in Florida. Um, it shows the percent of students that were referred for special education in 2003-2004 in first, second, and third grade. And you notice for all grades, nearly cut in half in 2010, directly related to actually teaching kids to read. Most kids refer to special education as because they struggle in reading. Huge. They benefited hugely from this policy and still do today. This is just another example of the progress in which Florida has made. Um, this is our national report card, the nation's report card, if you will. And in 1998, we were about a half a grade level below the national average, and today we are a half a grade level above the national average. Two years, full years of improvements since 1998 with our fourth grade readers. And then lastly, typically the question, well, what about the kids that were retained? How are they doing, right? And so um, Marcus Winters and Jay Green um, have studied Florida's policy specifically. And after two years of the policy, our students that were retained compared to students that just met the cut score for promotion were outperforming those students. Um, and the students that benefited the most after two years were our minority population. Um, and then by seventh grade, those students are still outperforming those kids just promoted in reading and in math. Um, those kids now have graduated high school if they're on the trajectory that they should have been. Um, and there's research being conducted currently as we speak. We're looking forward to the results come summer is, is the goal, if you will. Um, so they're looking at a lot of things like did retained students take more AP classes than um, students that were socially promoted or promoted, they just met the cut score for promotion. Um, did, did we decrease the dropout rate? because of the intervention services they received in their retained year. This is just a map of the states that have comprehensive K-3 reading policies across the nation. Um, there are two other states that have, um, uh, have K-3 prevention intervention and intervention for promotion. Um, that's Iowa and Virginia. And then there's 20 other states that have some of these fundamental principles that I've talked about, maybe one, maybe two. Um, so starting an infrastructure to build upon. Um, but they have some of the fundamental principles, but not the comprehensive policy. So we have a lot of states focused on K-3 reading, which is really exciting. Um, so that's exciting. <laughs> 
lessons learned um, as it relates to our work at the foundation and working with states like Ohio and Mississippi and just from our experience in Florida, um, here are a few things that we've learned. Um, the very first one is the belief that all kids can learn to read. Um, there are good cause exemptions, basically, that exempt students from this policy, and it's not a blanket exemption. Um, what some states sometimes do is have a blanket exemption for students with disabilities. Um, we heavily encourage that not to occur. Um, we believe students with disabilities can learn to read and can learn to read by the end of third grade. Um, and so the belief is they can do it. So my golly, we're going to get them there. And so um, there shouldn't be a blanket exemption for those students. So students with disabilities that may have significant cognitive disabilities, is about 1% of the population typically in a state, um, would be exempt from this policy. Um, English language learners. Um, we recognize the special needs of English language learners, but not all English language learners should be exempt from this policy. They are capable of reading by the end of third grade, but some, may be exempt, and that's students that have had less than two years of English instruction. You know, we can't quite expect them to be readers just like us, if you will, because um, they've only had two, less than two years of instruction in English. So that is another population that could be exempt from this policy. One other lesson learned was setting the cut score for kids that may face retention. I kind of hit on this a little bit. Um, our goal is proficiency for our third grade students, but we also know that only kids that are severely below grade level needs an entire year of intensive intervention. So really thinking carefully if you're considering this policy is how you set the initial cut score on your statewide reading assessment for who may be facing retention. Um, it's very important that you catch the kids that actually need an entire year of intensive intervention. So just keep that in mind moving forward if considering such a policy. And lastly, rollout of the policy matters. Um, don't go too slow. Don't go too fast. Um, Florida adopted the policy 2002 and implemented it the very next year, full implementation retaining that year. Um, Mary Laura probably can speak a little bit better as it relates to how that went down. Um, but we worked through it and um, we've got results now because of it. So we're happy in the way in which it rolled out for Florida. But we would encourage a couple year rollout, not too long, because you can get pushed back in between while you're waiting to have full implementation with the retention component, um, but not too fast either. So, um, and I think that's all I have. So I think we're ready. You do not have a PowerPoint. No, no they won't let me use PowerPoint, but <laughs> Sarah will. But 16 years ago, 16 years ago, I was a school superintendent of a pretty good school district on the east side of Columbus. And my son had been a longtime hockey player, and I was at a hockey rink, and it was cold, and I was sitting by parents of friends of my son. And this one dad came over, his son's name was Andy, he came over to me and said, we're signing up for high school classes as sophomores, and your people wanting to sign up for algebra too. He said, but he can't read. And I said, really? We went back in, we did some assessments, and indeed this 14-year-old this freshman couldn't read. So I asked our high school principal, well, let's assign a teacher to teach this youngster to read. He said, I don't have anybody in the high school staff that can teach a youngster to read. And I said, well, then you're going to have to contract with Huntington Learning or someone, because this youngster deserves the right to learn to read. And he did that. Andy is now 30 years old. He's now a high school graduate, college graduate, and well-employed. It hit me hard 16 years ago to listen to that when it was the district I was representing that that was happening in. 10 years ago, Ohio's legislature passed a fourth grade reading guarantee. It failed. And what was lacking was political courage. It was implemented, it was there, and just a very few of us that stayed the course on the fourth grade reading guarantee until it just was never fully implemented. In 2010, Governor Casey took office. He asked me to become the director of education for him about a year later. 
The governor and I recognized that we had 24,000 students in our state that were dropping out of school each year. 24,000. We recognized that we had a million adults in our state that did not have high school degrees, and the number was growing. And he was totally committed to turning that tide of illiteracy around in the state of Ohio, because we knew that the connection between literacy and dropouts, literacy and incarceration in our prison, we just knew that. If we're going to improve literacy in Ohio, we had to implement the third grade guarantee now. So 2012, that happened. But we, we focused on the guarantee, on the fact that every child needs the right to be able to read and control their learning in the future and not retention, much as Kerry has talked about. But we also had to compel schools to intervene early. When the fourth grade reading guarantee, there were some flaws in the law because we, we kind of didn't, we surprised people. The new law that we passed required uh, notification of parents. It required early identification. It required intervention. It required progress monitoring from year to year, and it still does. Those are the components that make good policy that Kerry's already talked about. But we, we worked, the governor and I worked hard to put the guarantee through the legislature. And I'm going to stop right here because I have two senators, Senator Lehner and Senator Jones. Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. You, you are two of them that made this happen. And it, it took political courage because, trust me, not everybody was in agreement with us at that time. It wasn't easy, but we used every bit of research we could uh, and stole everything we could from Florida to explain and justify and we hope that not a single child would be retained that was our goal we want everybody to be successful that was our goal the results of that i released yesterday interesting um we, and i left to stay yes <laughs> <laughs> the reality of it is this this was a winner it was a winner for our boys and girls in the state of Ohio. And we look at the data of the promotion rate from a year ago at 88% of our students. This year, we're going to be at 96% promotion rate. That's going to creep up a little bit because of some appeals that are happening. And, and I think that as we look at that number, there were multiple opportunities for the students to get that. We do a fall assessment. We do a spring assessment. This year, we allowed for a summer assessment, and we use alternative assessment, uh, three alternative possibilities. 90% uh, of our students, or 91% of our students, passed the three assessments, one, one of the three, either fall, spring, or summer. Uh, we had about 4% that passed the alternative assessment. So the great news for me is about 9,000 more students in the state of Ohio met a threshold from promotion to, to fourth grade that they would not have met a year ago. Now, the other news, because that's just part of it. The other news we have is that nearly 5,000 students did not meet that threshold. It is vitally incumbent upon us, me and us, to reach out wherever those students are and make sure they receive those skills that they need to be successful. So, but I think if I look at it a different way, we had 9,000 that met it. We had 5,000 in. 14,000 students without this provision would have been socially promoted into fourth grade without the skills needed to be successful. That's the way I look at it. We're committed to making sure that those students don't have those skills, receive them. Uh, they're they're going to get a lot of attention. One of the things I will talk about, I watch my time here, uh, talk about is the fact that I allocated a senior staff member to meet and talk and visit with the 10 districts in the state with the largest number of third graders that had not been successful in the past. You got a picture of what kind of districts those are. But I also assigned him to visit and talk and communicate with the 10 districts that had the highest percentage of lack of success. And on top of that, then I made personal calls to those 20 school districts and explained that this was my priority and the governor's priority about what needed to happen. Some of those conversations were not pleasant. Some people had never, superintendents had never had the state superintendent call them and say, you know what, you're pretty bad at teaching children how to read. We need to work together to make sure that gets better, fast. 
And, and so amazingly, when I, I was reading not a great article from the Cleveland Plain Dealer today about our third grade reading, but a good one, uh, they did highlight the 10 uh, school districts with the highest number of students that did not pass. We only had two. I only had two of those 10 districts that were on my 20 list. So it tells me that my uh, involvement, my engagement with these schools has made a difference. And we're going to engage with these 10 too now. But So my, my mission, we have 5,000 students that did not receive that uh, passing skill, the passing rate and the skills they need, we're going to do that. Well, the challenges we faced, how many times have you been in a school or a superintendent or a teacher or a community member say, it's an unfunded mandate? I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard that. And my response when they tell me that, I said, well, I used to teach at a state university in the history of education. And I recollect, I'm not, my memory's fading in my age, but I recollect talking about the common school in this country, in Massachusetts, starting primarily to teach boys and girls how to read. That's why we started. So you're telling me that that's, that's an unfunded mandate in the state of Ohio. Well, it's not. It's our primary mission. And then they would talk to me about the cost. And I would say, well, you tell me how much it costs to move reading instruction in your school building from 60 minutes a day to 150 minutes a day. What's that cost you? It doesn't cost you anything other than your priorities. What do you think is important? What do you value? If reading is important, and spend your time there. It's not an unfunded man mandate, it's your mission, and you need to make it your mission and you need to spend more time on which schools, because of a little nudge from the legislature, uh, did move up across the board, but many moved to a, from 90 minutes to 150 minutes a day. The schools were upset about, afraid of upsetting their parents. I mean, I've seen too many students that drop out of school. You know, it's amazing, we're worried about the parents when we're telling them that this youngsters don't have the skills to read, learn to read. But you know, when I've seen social promotion and those students move from the front row to the mid row to the back row through the grades and guess what? Ninth grade, 10th grade, they just don't show up. They just disappear. And there's no fanfare, there's no excitement, they just go away and, and we all just keep going and we've sent another youngster into a pathway to poverty and it's outrageous. So uh, I think unfunded mandate, I think uh, the focus, we really converted the focus on intervention and, and not uh, retention. Tried to work with the parents. I think I met, Sarah, I think I met with ed every editorial board in the state of Ohio. They had a newspaper where we were trying to talk to them. We did op-eds across the state of Ohio. We got huge support from our editorial boards in the state of Ohio. All the major newspapers uh, came out in support of the third grade reading guarantee because they understood. But you have to reach out and you have to convey the message that this is how it happens. I mean, we're selling kids short if we don't believe that they can do it. The other thing that I thought was a challenge, <clears throat> and you can kick me when I go to okay. them. She kicks me. Okay. Kick the other thing I thought was a challenge and probably our biggest success you know, when I talk to teachers, my whole family's been involved in education. When I talk to teachers and superintendents and educators, there really was a belief, a doubt, whether the teachers really could do this. It was personal. I'm not sure as a teacher I can be able to ensure that this youngster can read at third grade level. Really personal and, and there's really doubt in people's mind. The other doubt that we had to attack was a belief that the student could reach that threshold. So part of our thrust throughout the state when I talked and I spoke about this at every time I spoke was that you can do it as a teacher. You have the ability and skills to do it and our students have the knowledge and capabilities to do it if we do it the right way. So with the proper support, that needed to happen. So if there was an accomplishment I think we had, I think we have shown because of the efforts and commitments of our teachers, our parents, our principals, community members focusing on this, we've gotten to where we are, but we aren't, we aren't where we need to be. We still have those 5,000 students, and, but I think a lot more superintendents and principals and teachers feel like, you know what, we can do this. We can accomplish this. Um, I guess, 
you know, the stories. I mean, the, the Columbus City Superintendent was going door to door, knocking on doors to try to get students to come to evening interventions and summer intervention programs. The Columbus City School Superintendent was going door to door. That was, could be modeled throughout the state. We had to also fight hysteria. I had a newspaper in a small town, Lancaster Eagle Gazette, that uh, was, had headlines in March that there are gonna be 300 third graders in Fairfield County, a small rural county, that are gonna be retained. It's gonna cause all court, court sort of havoc on scheduling and math and science, snarling schedules. It said snarling schedules in the newspaper. I said, you know what, when we got done, it was a different story. Not 300, that was 18. So part of this is for us as educators and communities believing this is something that needs to happen and we just have to do it. We have to create that courage. The courage that Governor Kasich had to say, this has to happen. It's non-negotiable, we're gonna make it happen. He did that. I probably wouldn't be working for him if, if he hadn't had that passion for literacy because I struck home with that 16 years ago personally with, with my own situation. The third grade reading guarantee in Ohio is here to stay and we give a lot of credit and modeling to Florida because we learned a lot from Florida in our process and I know Senator Rayner would agree with that hugely because I think they came up and spoke with us several times as we were working through the enacting the bill. Uh, a couple other things, we work closely with the Chancellor of the Board of Regents. Part of this is teacher preparation and, and getting teachers the skills. I, I also, as I went around, I heard teachers, I don't know how to teach reading, they didn't teach me how to teach reading. So the Chancellor and I are on the same floor at, at the department building and we talk about this a lot and we're committed to raising those standards and changing the coursework. The other thing quickly is early childhood. Our third grade reading has forced a expansion of early childhood throughout the state. The governor has uh, allocated uh, 22 million additional dollars in the last budget. We're proposing to the state board another 30 million. There's a connection between early childhood preparation and success on the third grade reading guarantee. It goes hand in hand. Quickly, I'm gonna say one other thing that we're looking at real closely now in Ohio is attendance. There's a huge correlation between students that are in school I miss school less than 10 days and success. And the more days they miss school, the worse it gets. We're, we're gonna be looking more and more at this because I think that uh, connection is hugely important for us and I think it's hugely important for the students. We have to come up with some strategies that would allow us to hit at that problem. Um, we're committed to make sure students are literate. I don't want them moving from that front row to the back row and disappearing. Our dropout rate's going to drop in the state of Ohio. We've, we've addressed programs for that one million adults without the high school diploma. And I, I'm just telling you, I can't live with those 24,000 and we're going to develop a pathways and develop pathways. These youngsters get these skills and they get a diploma, which is just a marker onto a real, the real deal, which is really a good job and a good life and in and, and this state, great state of Ohio and this great country. So, thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Senator? Thank y'all and thank you for inviting me uh, to talk on this issue, which has really become uh, the most important issue that I, I work with and, and, and very passionate about it. But it wasn't initially that way and, and it goes back to the saying about sometimes you don't know what you don't know. I served on the education committee for 17, 18 years and um, I'd never went over to the Department of Education. And in the past six months, I've been over there more times than I went in all those other combined 18 years. And it, it makes a big difference. And I'll talk about that from the legislature, but I want to back up. I'm from Oxford, Mississippi, which is the home <laughs> of the university or Ole Miss. But it's also uh, an interesting thing. In Mississippi, we have one of the highest poverty rates and other issues that we have to deal with. But also, we have some of the greatest writers in our history in American history William Faulkner is from Oxford and I, I was reading a book from our independent bookstore in Oxford and I just happened to be looking at there's a quote on here by a fellow named Larry Brown who's now deceased but Larry was a firefighter from Tula Mississippi and one day he walked into Square Books and he said I want to be a writer to the owner and uh, he said okay let me give you this book these series of books to read uh, great writers of the American 20th century and guess what, Larry Brown, a firefighter, 
learned how to be a writer and actually won several prizes. I don't know if any of y'all read any of his books, uh, but one of several several books and and did did a great job. And now we you know we have all kind of writers in Oxford. It's kind of you can't walk down the around the square without bumping into somebody as either a writer or a wannabe writer. John Grisham as well. Who but you don't resides. have cowbells. That's I'm right. sorry. No cowbells. <laughs> but but one thing that Larry Brown said, which I was like, this is really providential that this is on my bookmark, the book I was reading, and I'm gonna have to get my glasses out. He says, all we have to do as people is keep teaching our children to read, and the rest will more than likely take care of itself. And I can't say any more than that. And, and God bless Larry Brown, good Lafayette County boy. And, and that's, that's it. And, and this policy, to me, encapsulates that. And I was shocked that only 10 states have a third grade reading policy. If you don't have it, my question is why not? Because if Mississippi is doing this, and we are, uh, we all need to be working on this. If we're gonna lift this country up, um, working, it, one of the fundamental roles of el education be, should be teaching children to read. And um, when the foundation wagon rolled into town with Governor Bush at the head, it, it, was a, it was an educational epiphany to me that I was like, wow, why, didn't, why weren't we doing this in the first place? Why weren't we focused on teaching reading? And um, over time, it, it just makes so much difference of focusing on one of these this policy in terms of the difference it can make. And one of the things I looked at, if we go back, I think we were to start back. When they came in. Is that it? Back, no, back, there you go. They came in and did a presentation for Mississippi, the foundation did. And this is what knocked my socks off. This is a comparison of the NAEP scores in Mississippi, we're in the green, in Florida in the red. And look how close we were back in 1994. That gives you an idea. We were pretty comparable. And then all of a sudden in 1994, nine governor bush comes in and implements a plus program is there do i need any more data to tell me we need to do something in mississippi i mean it's dramatic the change that occurred there um and and you know it's it's also disappointing that what were we doing of the pat in the in the 2000s um so this is what i use not only in the legislature and the with the foundation but going out to my community and my rotary clubs and talking to educators saying why aren't our NAEP scores, you know, the national standard comparable? What have we been doing? And so it goes to the next one. Um, this, this compares in the blue our state assessment at the time, MCT2, showing that we had 87% proficient uh, in fourth grade, but yet the NAEP scores showed 55, and that's a 12,000 12, uh, student difference. And obviously, like some states have, the standards were a little watered down. So we're really fooling ourselves in, in telling us, uh, oh, everybody, our students are proficient, we're doing a great job. Yet NAEP threw some cold water in our face and said, you know, this is, this is what's really happening here. We can go to the next one. Now, when I went out to the, our communities that sell this, and we passed this legislation in 2013, I said, you know, athletics is a big part of our, our high schools, and it, it's an important role. Bradley's a community. And I said, but let's compare at the time the top 20 football teams and where their reading rates are, their literacy rates. And I think this, again, uh, wakens people up to where we are. And I mean, you look at some of the top schools there, less than half of their uh, third grade students were proficient readers. And as we know, based on the statistic, about 90% of um, the third graders dropped out. You can, you can do the math and figure out where some of the, and some of these schools do have dropout rates that are comparable. You can project where they go. Um, but that, that was very telling. And in terms of, and even in my hometown, number nine there, Oxford, it was 61%. And here's, here's an uh, interesting thing, when we passed the, um, Literacy Promotion Act in 2013, it went from 61% to 71%, 10% increase just because of the awareness of focusing on uh, third grade reading. It made a huge difference even in our, our good schools. And then, you know, you talk about the good schools and you're saying, well, things are okay in my school. It's, it's those schools where, you know, the underserved kids. These, this is a, a Nate fourth grade reading, proficient or better, middle and high income and you see where mississippi is at 40 percent down there 
Um, so e even with middle and high income, there was an impact and, and a, a factor that made a difference. And you see at the top, Massachusetts, and I see Florida there at number eight, I believe, five, seven or eight. So, I mean, I, I was going out and, and talking to the community that, hey, this is an issue, we need to focus on it. And I think it was very revealing uh, to people who don't deal with education every day and say, hey, this, we need to focus on this issue right here. So, next. I don't. And even within a small county, this is Prentice County up in northeast Mississippi, um, you had a high free and reduced lunch um, in your population, white population, 93% in Prentice County, and go to the next. Even with this in county, you, you had 163 third graders, and at the top you had one little elementary school on the east side that had an 80% proficiency rate, but then at the bottom you had little jumper town at 28%. That wide divergence within a small school district like that, um, that obviously they weren't focused on it because you shouldn't have that huge gap between two, um, schools within a same uh, county in Mississippi. And so I think what, what happened when we, when we worked on this Literacy Promotion Act, it brought awareness to it within the schools and the school districts and brought accountability too uh, to our schools. And, and again, working in a partnership with our state superintendents here and our chairman of State Board of Education, uh, that makes a big difference. And once we pass the legislation, you know, sometimes as somebody said, the um, Mississippi Code is paid with good intentions in terms of trying to do right by education, I can tell you. And I'm, I've been a part of that. Sometimes I feel like in the legislature with education and in the educators, we always want the new, new thing. The new silver bullets are going to change everything. And I've decided this, this piece of legislation, if we build around it, and early education is a big part of it, and, and we're doing some things in Mississippi ab about that. But you, you have to have a, a um, goal, and the goal is teaching a child to read by third grade. Now, we have to do things to work around that goal, and early education is a component which we worked on. Um, teacher education, making sure our uh, schools of education are working uh, to teach the science of reading. And, and as I've seen somewhere else, I and mean, this is y'all's area, but <laughs> teaching reading is rocket science. And, you know, again, it was, a, it was a light bulb that went off in my head how important that was. Um, and it is to teachers. And part of our Literacy Promotion Act is teacher training, um, teaching all the teachers in K-3 um, with professional development as, and the principals as well. And a lot, of the, a lot of our teachers are embracing it, and it's making a big difference and a, a big turnaround, which is exciting. And like I said, in a state like Mississippi, uh, where we do have a wide income gap and, and high poverty, but yet we have some of the greatest writers. We need to be reading every day. In my, talking about adult literacy, in my community where we have one of the highest high school graduation and college graduation rates in the state, 20 to 25 percent of our adults are illiterate. And I would suspect that's in some of your states as well, and you just don't know it because the stigma is so great, people do not want you to know they cannot read. And we've got to change that, and the way we do it is intervene as early don't delay the inevitable of a child dropping out of high school. Do everything we can to work with them in, the, in those early grades, and, and I think it will make a huge difference. And it's not just the schools, it's the communities. Working with organizations um, like the Annie Casey Foundation, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, the attendance works. Attendance is a, such a huge issue that we're, Mississippi is focused on that now. How, again, another light bulb. Why weren't make, people making sure the children were going to school? Nationally, you'll see kindergarten, there's a 11% uh, or more that miss, miss 18, or day, 18 or more days of school, which is about 10, it is 10% of the school day. There's a direct correlation between poor performance in school and the number of days you miss. And, and we're focusing on that as well in Mississippi. To, and it's a long-term solution. It's not going to be changed overnight. Uh, but I think we're making the right investments to uh, turn Mississippi or get Mississippi moving in the right direction. Uh, so that we can have our NAEP scores have a trajectory like they had in Florida. Thank you. So I had this whole list of questions to ask, and um, Superintendent Ross addressed every one of them already, so <laughs> I have no questions for him, however. <laughs> um, Senator Tolleson, you said um, the huge stigma of adult literacy, um, and one of the things that we hear a lot, it was 
a huge issue in Florida. It continues to be, and it's a valid question to raise, um, is the issue of self-esteem. I refer to my husband as an academic red shirt. He was retained in fourth grade in Florida, um, and he spent most of his time in the art um, closet because the teacher didn't know how to deal with him So, because he was a horrible behavior problem, so she put him in the art cl uh, closet. Uh, self-esteem, and you hear a lot about you cannot retain a kid in third grade, it will ruin their self-esteem. But you talk about the stigma of adult literacy. Um, how did you, in, and this is uh, for you, Senator Tolson, how did you um, work with your colleagues in the legislature to, especially with the um, high minority rates and the fact that these are the students who people just assume can't learn, so we don't even try. Um, how, do, how did you address the issues of self-esteem and the, the concern about the self-esteem of children? Well, I, I think the main thing was communicating the issue of what we weren't doing to teach reading and to say we're not doing enough. And, and I, I think that overcame the issue of the, the retention issue that at some point you have to you have to have an end goal and if you don't do this there we we have the problem of so, social promotion and uh, it otherwise will not get done and as i said why would you delay the inevitable of this child more than likely dropping out of school if they're unable to read and i think that's that was a the the argument i made but i think stepping back the the bigger issue was half of our kids in Mississippi in third grade are not reading on grade level. We've got to do something to change that. And, and that kind of preempted any issue relating to, um, any pushback related to retention. And, and I think it has to be, um, other, you have to have that, otherwise it won't get done. And it doesn't begin, as y'all know, just in third grade. It begins at birth, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're doing more with parent education and, and things of that matter, and, and promoting early education. And in kindergarten, first, second, third grade, I mean, we just passed the kindergarten readiness assessment statewide and had the first results to show a child coming into kindergarten in Mississippi where they stand. And that gives us a, it's a good early indicator, okay, we need to work with this individual student right there. So you have three years. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it, you put that, you know, in place but as you've said before it's the last resort you're working with that child day in and day out mm -hmm. and it's not just educators it's the parents mm -hmm. it's the community so, so i'm going to put carrie on the spot um she has a very compelling story when she was a third grade teacher i'm sorry of a uh, student who um, was sent to her for their retained year um, who ended up being an, a success story so so two students um and I won't give names, although they're, they're near and dear to my heart, um, came into my third grade class as retained students. Um, the very first week, not, not happy campers, right? I mean, they knew. They had, they had other students passing in the hallway saying, why are you in the third grade line, you know? Um, so they, they got a little bit of that the very first week, but within not even, not even a week later, um, it was crazy to see um, in the classroom itself how they became so confident in, in their reading skills because they were no longer severely below grade level. They were the average student, maybe even a little higher because they've been there, done that. Um, and to see them become so confident, raising their hands, no longer you know, scrunching down in their chair and hiding from answering questions, but eager to answer questions after reading a particular story. Um, I have one student that came in scoring at the lowest achievement level in state tests, ended up scoring a level three by the end of third grade, which is proficient in, in Florida. And then I had another student that simply did not go to school. He did not like school. He was a very shy child, um, was retained in third grade, and just made a welcoming environment for him. Be realized that he actually was a very smart kid and, and matter of fact was voted class at, in the class as representative for school council and he was just blown away um, so built confidence in him when he became a better reader he actually again total attendance issue the pre previous year actually started like coming to school went from a the lowest um, achievement level on our state test level one to the highest level five 
Um, so just two students that actually hugely benefited from having another year of third grade and actually built their confidence moving forward to face the more rigorous coursework in fourth grade. So. And obviously that's a testament to the teacher, right? Yeah. To, oh. to Carrie, um, I put her on the spot, I should at least praise her, but she also had a <laughs> fabulous principal who held her accountable. This is from the parent to the student to the classroom, to the teacher, to the superintendent, to the legislature, to the state board, to the governor. And if you can get all of those uh, leaders making this a priority. There's some amazing things that can happen. Um, I know that Superintendent Ross wants to weigh in on self-esteem. Well, I, I, I did want to talk about the retention because one of the things that with the wisdom of uh, Senator Lehner we looked at was we, we were, you know, we ask about grade levels. I mean, grade levels are a concoction of the adults in the education <laughs> system and not about the kids. And so in our third grade reading uh, guarantee, we the student would be retained if they weren't successful, but if they were competent and proficient in other areas, science, math, they could go to fourth grade and get appropriate instruction at the fourth grade level. You know, and it was almost like an aha moment for some of our school leaders, but you know, where I had been superintendent, we'd been doing multi-grade level reading instruction for years. We would have a three, four reading, a two, three, all kinds of combinations. So we encouraged that to uh, try to address some of the perceived stigma, but it also created a focus that this is about skills and competency and not a rite of passage, and, but it did make it easier, I think, for our parents mm -hmm. to accept it. Um, one of the questions that, that we inevitably get, and it is a good question to ask, and uh, the superintendent touched on it, is um, how do you fund this? You're talking about teacher training and summer camps and assessments and parent training and reading coaches. How do you fund this without hundreds of millions of dollars? Um, and so I'd really like for, for Carrie and Senator Tolson to talk about how, um, talk about how Florida went about it. Um, and, and I think that you fund your priorities and you can commit new money, but it doesn't have to all be paid for with new money. So. Yeah, I think what Florida did and did well was first and foremost look at existing funds. Um, so looking at federal, state, and local funds to reprioritize those funds to K-3 literacy. Um, one example of that is there's a huge pot of funds um, that is for preventing dropouts, course credit recovery, and so forth. And because of the huge tie, if a kid cannot read by the end of third grade, that they're much more likely to drop out of high school, we were able to make that tie. And there was basically a chunk of that funding that was prioritized to K-3 literacy and summer camps first and foremost, and then the rest of the pot of funds could be used in every form or fashion the district wanted to use for, you know, to prevent dropout, um, dropout prevention. So, um, so that's just one example. There was also funding um, that we worked within the department, existing funding, Students with Disabilities Office, which many of our students that are facing retention is because they simply have not learned how to read. Um, they have a conference every year, and we said, well, let's make it about literacy. Um, and so we were able to work with a, another office within the department. They had funding set aside for a conference. We made it about literacy. We brought principals in and provided this conference with existing funds. There, so there is so much out there um, that you already have um, in pots of funding if you just analyze the funding in which you have and reprioritize it to focus on K-3, you can get a lot um, of bang for your buck. Um, and then the one thing Florida did do was had a, an allocation, $10 million, um, which actually was K-12 to put coaches in lowest performing, not just elementary schools, but elementary, middle, and high schools. It was $10 million. Again, I don't do math, but the K-3 setting is basically, I don't know, three million maybe, um, for reading coaches to provide that job embedded support, professional development, so teachers could apply skills, they can get supported, um, it's right there and they can master their craft right in the classroom. So just a couple examples of using um, existing funds and then a little new money to support the implementation of the policy. I th this, this is a good example of policy driving, changing the mindset and an administrator said to me last month, he said, great, you know this, what the Literacy Promotion Act has done. I'm now putting my best teachers in the elementary school where I used to put them in the high school. And I said, duh. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that makes so much sense that, and, it, and certainly 
a child that has an effective teacher in elementary school is going to go a lot, do a lot better with a less than effective teacher in high school than vice versa. So hopefully that's occurring across the state. But we also have provided this after in two years, $15 million. But here's the problem Mississippi ran into. We realized that we didn't have enough quality personnel in hiring literacy coaches. We had a goal initially, we being MDE, with of hiring 55 literacy coaches and they had maybe 500 applications and were able to pare that down to about 35. And I think now we only have 42 that work in the areas of greatest need. I think it's about 69 schools. So, and that made us realize we need to go back to our schools of ed to make sure they're doing the proper training. And this past year we put in effective in July of 2016 to require an assessment for our elementary teachers uh, to know that they have know the uh, skills of teaching reading. Um, so, and there's some other things that we've done, but, but that's the, the scarcity of qualified personnel in teaching reading. And that's the other part about professional development uh, with the training that they're getting uh, to either refresh or to teach the, that important skill. But it's the same thing too about repurposing Title I money and things of that nature. But uh, we, we just, education of the educators is, is a big part of this as well. And that's gonna take time. So Superintendent Ross has wants to say something real quickly and then we're going to open it up. We have about 15 minutes left for any questions from the audience. Just as in addition to <laughs> acknowledging they have the capabilities, uh, in our funding for, formula for the uh, school funding plan, we put a high priority and a high dollar amount on poverty and there was a connection between uh, where we were having less passage rate on our third grade reading and poverty. So a lot of resources were sent through our funding formula for those schools. In addition, the legislature allocated $13 million to implement this plan in a multiple way. So it wasn't just a, mm -hmm. what you're existing with. There was a commitment from both the Ohio legislature and the governor to uh, make this a focus also. Okay, so there are microphones set up. Um, if you have a question, if you can come up to the microphone. Um, there at the front of the room, sorry, it's very classroom led. <laughs> um, and if you'll just say where you're from uh, so that we can, it would be helpful who you are and where you're from. <laughs> Is, I'm not sure that's on because they may not be able to hear your question. literacy and what um, what you guys did in your states to make sure that our elementary school principals are prepared to empower their teachers um, to educate students um, around literacy because we often find that I think like you said for um, Senator Tolson for uh, teachers elementary school can be seen as a breeding ground for high school principals and therefore you don't get people in the classroom that are I mean in the leading the school that are necessarily able to support their teachers in the right way. In Florida, we hit the ground running. Um, we knew um, teachers are led by principals. And so we knew principals were definitely the folks in which we needed to ensure that professional development was provided. Um, one, one example of that is leadership conference in which I described you do, using monies in yeah. a certain way was targeted at principals first and foremost. But I will say um, it is a lesson learned in Florida. Um, as, as much as we paid attention to and had like a, a yearly um, literacy conference and our target audience was principals, teachers, and coaches continuously involving principals and teaching them about reading coach roles and so forth. Um, we could have done a better job. We heavily focused on reading coaches, building their knowledge, how they support teachers, but the reading coaches are led <laughs> by principals. And so um, afterthought was we need to have some principal reading coach um, professional development, how they work together, how the coach can help build master teachers school-wide versus wanting to help eight kids in the classroom, that you could build master teachers school-wide. So now you're helping 500 students in a class, in a school. Um, so that was a lesson learned for us. But we did yearly have an annual conference, but we definitely needed more professional development for our principals. So. I would say that's an area of weakness for us. We did staff development through our regional uh, support teams and through our ESCs, our regional agencies. Uh, but I think that's an area that we really probably could significantly improve on. 
What I said earlier, professional development, and that's for the teachers and the principals, something focused on principal leadership. But you need to back that up, too. Are your colleges of education doing the job they need to do? And I think we're realizing that around the country. What, what is, you know, is there a connection between um, this, the teaching of the curriculum in, in colleges of ed and uh, teaching literacy, teaching reading in our elementary schools? I'll add, add one thing. So Florida um, creates its own certification test. Um, we have a, a, an in-house test company or a test um, team that builds certification for teachers and for principals. And in order to, um, we couldn't get the colleges of ed to do anything. And so we said, what levers do we control? Well, we write our own certification tests. So pushing into principal ed leadership certification test and teacher certification test tests up questions that hit at the science of reading and not the art of reading so that colleges of ed were forced to um, at least address them uh, and trying to you know meet on on both ends so thinking of the levers that state departments have as well so yes sir hi I'm Doug Foshe I'm from Houston thank you for your presentation it's been very enlightening a question about the science and that is if if all the science talks about brain plasticity wh why the retention rates would be focused on third grade and not first grade and then the second question is in any of the states have you looked at what some other states are doing like the Kaiser Foundation in Oklahoma where they're actually starting in the labor and delivery room <laughs> and with pediatricians and OBGYNs and, and, and those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, I'll address the first part of that question. Um, and it's a, it's a valid point. Why are we waiting till third grade to um, provide a year's worth of intensive intervention services to accelerate progress to ensure kids are ready for fourth grade? It's a huge transition from third to fourth grade, and that's and, and actually the data supports if kids aren't reading by them third grade. It's a you know it it, it ties greatly to dropout. Um, but the reality of the policy that occurred in um, Florida, we actually had huge increases in retentions K two because schools decided to intervene earlier. Um, so that's something else that I don't think we planned for, but actually ended up occurring because there was an urgency that kids are reading by the end of third grade and principals completely reorganized their entire day around ensuring kids are reading by the end of third grade. And they intervened earlier finding that there are kids in first and second grade that need an entire year of intensive intervention. My golly, we need to start earlier. So the policy itself actually ended up having kids in first and second grade being held back to give them the intervention services in which they need to move forward. So it actually had a great effect to me in that respect. And then the latter half, I'm not sure if either of you want to address that question. I can talk about it. Okay, Please let me talk about it. I really want to talk about it. Um, part of what Carrie was talking about, partnerships um, that we did. So uh, we heard about this fabulous program called Reach Out and Read. And it was based on the fact that the number one person that, that parents of young children listen to and take their advice are pediatricians. And so is this national program where you go in for your yearly checkup and the, the pediatrician says, here's your um, prescription for your asthma medication and here's your prescription for reading. You need to read to your child 20 minutes a day and here's a book. Um, and we partnered with the Florida Medical Association who agreed to take that on and make that a, a huge uh, piece of, of what they did. The other thing, um, and this was Florida corporations who decided this is how we're going to help in this effort, um, it was called an I'm a Reader Kit, and it was given to parent, it was given to mothers in the hospital after they had their child, and in it, it had, here's information on adult literacy, um, and it was in Spanish, English, Haitian Creole, here's baby's first library card, and all of these things, the thought was we give them um, coupons for Pampers and formula, let's give them things that will, as they leave, immediately start thinking about how can they help be their, you know, their child's first readers um, when they get them home, so. Thank you. And since you mentioned that, I've got to bring this one up that I've learned about, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, and um, we have it in our community. I think half of the counties in Tennessee have that, obviously, Dolly Parton from there. But what that does is you sign your child up at birth, and they get a book once a month mm -hmm. up until age five. And the point of that is the research that shows that uh, the more books you have in the home, the greater your chance of uh, reading at grade level. And it certainly, uh, I think it, may, it would make a big difference. And, and also working with the summer learning loss part, uh, which is a big component, especially in underserved communities. So we, I think we have time for uh, one more question. 
the, all of the panelists are going to be here until tomorrow at 2, so if you can't get them today, um, they, they will be around. But um, you didn't have to leave. I was going to pick you. <laughs> 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 Nothing against you. <laughs> um, I, I actually, we may have time for two. I'm not letting Andres ask a question, so go ahead. <laughs> I'm Leanne Winter. I'm from North Carolina, and I would agree about the way you roll it out is really important. We have had some real struggles in North Carolina, which leads to my two questions. Oh, one, you can you, only have one. You can only because she's got to ask okay. one too. <laughs> well, then I will ask about. Um, we have seen starting at the end of last year, beginning of this year, um, a lot of complaints coming from principals and superintendents about getting teachers to want to teach in third grade anymore that we are having teachers asked to leave third grade, go to other grades, and they are having real recruitment problems getting teachers to come into third grade. Could you all talk about that a little bit and what you've done to um, alleviate let, that? Let me start uh, because we did have that and, and that was a concern and we had uh, upped the standards requirements for the teachers to do the teachers of reading in third grade. I think that the best remedy is what I'm announced last night is the success that teachers have had. If it's doable, it's getting them to believe they can do it. I think when they see the success that an improvement that happened in Ohio will have less problems. But it was real and it was an issue as we dealt with trying to deal with the skills, credentialing that the teachers need at third grade for us. But I think the results are going to override that uh, across the state now. Not everywhere. But Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Haar and I'm an Ohio first grade teacher, kindergarten as well, and hello Dr. Ross. <laughs> and I'm serving um, this school year as um, an Einstein Fellow here um, in the DC area, so we've met before, it's yes. been a while. <laughs> but my, my question is, um, you know, I've, um, uh, I've, I have felt the pressure of the third grade guarantee policy and I felt how it um, in many ways has hindered my ability in the classroom to, to provide um, a really well-balanced 21st century learning experience for the children. And what I mean by that is learning to read. I know all the research behind it. Children need, need to, to be able to read by age third grade because of retention rates, because of um, incarceration facts and all of that. But, but also there's this thing called developmentally appropriate practice that early childhood educators are very well aware of. And I think that's where some of the fear has come from with teachers saying, gee, I don't know if I can get my students there. And that's because the, because children all progress and grow at different rates. And they're on a continuum, but a teacher can only do so much about that. And secondly, because of the push for the third grade guarantee, I've noticed that a lot of the professional development for early childhood teachers has focused on literacy. And I've, I feel like I received a very, um, a very good training in, in my undergraduate work, and I've done more to, you know, to help children learn to read. I've taken more workshops and classes. But what's happened is that in elementary grades, we have no diversity of backgrounds now. For instance, on paper, I, am an early childhood educator, and I have a master's in biology. I am, my background compared to someone else on paper, because I don't have a reading endorsement and, and all these other bells and whistles that go with it, I'm worried that my background isn't as valued as much as, as others too. So let's let him go ahead and try to address some of those things. Okay, sorry for the long question. Okay. As we look at credentials, I, I did, and have talked to Senator Rayner about the additional licensure should be included for performance. I mean, if you're actually teaching students and they're learning, that should be a licensure criteria. And I, and, and I think that is important. Students do, do, do learn at different paces and levels, but you know, in Ohio, our NAEP scores did not move in 10 years from the time that we had the fourth grade reading and it disappeared until we did the third grade. It didn't, they were flat. And, and part of that is about expectations and focus. And I, so I don't disagree with you that students learn differently and I, it is a focus of mine. And you know if you're, because yeah, yeah. every time I go out and speak and everything, we've, we've reallocated dollars into literacy and, but we have also expanded the early childhood 
part. And, and, the, and I thank you for that. Right, because, <laughs> because as, as I often say, it often isn't fair to kindergarten teachers with as far back as some of these students are entering school. So, so I, as I look at the third grade reading, the expansion, it's forced an expansion of early childhood, not just from the state, from Department of Ed and from the governor with support of Senator Lehner and the Senate to expand those opportunities. But some of us even happen locally. And we still have a long ways to go with that coordination with our jobs and family services. But to me, that's a huge component to get where we need to be because developmentally appropriate for a youngster that hasn't had reading experiences and going into kindergarten is one way to put it. Other is we have an obligation to reach out to those youngsters prior to kindergarten and give them those opportunities because it's really their lack of experiences that makes it developmentally inappropriate for them at sure. that time. So we just can't accept that. Our students need to be literate at third grade and be having passed the third grade reading guarantee. It's gonna drive our actions, it'll drive my recommendations for actions. So how do we get there to make sure that ultimately, that maybe, guess what? We don't even need a test. We just know that every one of our students in the state are gonna be proficient in reading by third grade because that's just what we do. That's when we, we start at an early age and we make sure that happens. So how are we going to what, increase the, the I'm diversity sorry, we, among? We really do need to wrap yeah. up. What I would like, can you take back, take me back to the to the slide of the um, student in ninth grade? Yes. Yes. So I can't imagine what it must be like to be an elementary school teacher. I prefer teenagers <laughs> over little ones like nobody's business. But I felt the pressure as a ninth and a 10th and 11th and a 12th grade teacher of students who had been passed through the system. And I, I was fabulous in my history content, but I didn't know how to reach a child who couldn't spell the word soldier or even the word paid. And so there is pressure on either end, but there should be pressure on the system. There should be pressure on teachers. And if I had been um, confident in my ability to help a child, then I wouldn't have I might still be in the classroom. It was very difficult. But the, the goal is to not have any more of these. Not in ninth grade, not in fifth grade, not in fourth grade. I really want to thank our panel um, for the, the work that they do in their states. Um, I'm so proud that Mississippi has decided to, um, to tackle this because we are first in being fat, and I am sick of first in <laughs> being fat. I want us to be, and I still say us, I want us to be, I want us to lead the nation in gains. I want the kids in Ohio to, to benefit, and the kids in Florida, and the kids in the nation, because, I mean, it's the most important thing. Reading is fundamental. So thank you all very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.